the Rock and Roll Unravel Show. Welcome to another Rock and Roll Unraveled show. This time we're taking a look at the rise and fall of American rock and roll in the 1950s. Now rock and roll's got its roots in both black and white American music. You can find elements of gospel, blues, R&B, doo-wop, as well as country, hillbilly, rockabilly. I mean it can all be heard in rock and roll, as we'll see as we go along. The first rock and roll record is generally considered to be Rocket 88, from Jackie Brenston and his Delta Cats in 1951. But it was in 1955 that Rock Around the Clock really kick-started rock and roll, when it played behind the opening credits of the movie Blackboard Jungle. Now, the golden age of rock and roll followed, but the first cracks appeared just two and a half years later, 1957, when Little Richard was on tour in Australia. He had an epiphany, found God and renounced rock and roll. After Little Richard left the rock and roll stage, the others followed, and essentially the rock and roll hits dried up. By the end of the 1950s, it was all but over. Rock and roll limped into the early 1960s, but as Bob Dylan said, the uh, times they were a-changing. Elvis famously reinvented himself as a movie star in the 1960s, and ironically... The 1960s beat and R&B groups revitalized the careers of many of the blues and R&B and rock and roll stars. But the golden age of rock and roll, well, that'll live forever. Now, we've got four great songs on the show. The first one is generally considered to be the first rock and roll record. And the second one's, um, well, essentially the B-side of the song that kick-started rock and roll but that was the A-side when the single was first released. Now, that will all become very clear shortly. And we've got two more absolute rock and roll classics for you. Now, the story behind the first song will be coming along shortly. But this is generally considered to be the first rock and roll record from 1951. This is Jackie Brenston and his Delta Cats with Rocky 88. A number of contenders for the accolade of first rock and roll record, and they must include Arthur Big Boy Crudup and his uh, 1946 recording of uh, That's All Right. That was the song that Elvis actually chose for his first sun single in 1954. And also Fats Domino, in February 1950, he had his first R&B hit with the, the Fat Man. It was written by Domino and uh, Dave Bartholomew. Now, Dave Bartholomew is a name that will pop up a lot when they're talking about um, Fats Domino. And that was recorded at Cosimo Matassa's J&M Studios in New Orleans. And what we just heard was the song that's usually cited as the first rock and roll record. And that was from uh, Jackie Benson, his Delta Cat, Rocky 88, uh, released in April 1951. The session itself, the recording session, was actually organised by Ike Turner, and Ike Turner's band cut four tracks that particular day. Piano player Turner took lead vocal on Heartbroken and Worried and I'm Lonesome Baby, and that was released as Ike Turner and his Kings of Rhythm. Now, sex, sax player Jackie Brenston, he took lead vocal on Rocket 88, and when that was coupled with Come Back Where You Belong. It was released as Jackie Brenston and his Delta Cats. Now, both sides were released on chess because the Sun Record label itself was still well, still a good year away. And the fuzz guitar you can hear is courtesy of Willie Kizzard. And it's one of the first examples of deliberate distortion in a rock and roll record. Rocket 88 was also recorded shortly afterwards by uh, Bill Haley and his Saddlemen, uh, before he was Bill Haley in his Comets. And that's one of the first white covers of a black R&B artist. And Rocket 88 itself? Well, that's an Oldsmobile motor car. Now, rock and roll was very much on the horizon now. And on the 11th of July 1951, Alan Freed as Moondog opened his R&B show on WJW in Cleveland. He was one of the first American DJs to popularise 
uh, black R&B. And he introduced it to a much wider, um, white audience. Alan Freed, he's also the guy credited with coining the term rock and roll. Throughout the 1940s, he appeared on radio and television. He was a sports presenter and DJ, but he was encouraged by local record shop owner Leo Mintz to join WJW. And, as I mentioned, calling himself Moondog, uh, began presenting an R&B show, the Moondog Rock and Roll House Party. Alan, Alan Freed one of the cornerstones of rock and roll. I mean, his activities soon expanded to include concert promotions and movies. But one thing it didn't expand to, it contracted a little, uh, when he found he had to drop the use of the name Moondog. He had threats of a lawsuit from Louis Thomas Moondog Hardin. Now, he was a legendary street performer who'd moved to New York in the early 1940s, and he could be found on the corner of 54th Street and 6th Avenue, resplendent, in Viking cape, helmet, and actually complete with a spear. Alan Freed's actually responsible for the first ever rock and roll concert. That was on the 21st of March 1952, when he organised the Moondog Coronation Ball in the Cleveland Arena. It, it advertised as having sensational stars, and these included Paul Williams' Hucklebuckers and Tiny Grimes' Rockin' Highlanders, along with the Dominoes. Now, the Dominoes spent 14 weeks at number one with their sing on the R&B charts with their single 60 Minute Man. That was back in 1951. And Freed actually broadcasted the uh, Moondog radio show directly from the, the ball. Now, the gig itself, the arena had 10,000 capacity and was completely sold out. But thousands more fans tried to gate crash. And despite being advertised to finish at um, two o'clock in the morning, the authorities closed the show down much earlier, really a sign of things to come for future rock and roll concerts. But if we jump forward now a couple of years to 1954, that was when Bill Haley and his Comets recorded Rock Around the Clock, famously on the 12th of April. It was written by James Myers and Max C. Freeman and recorded at the Pythian Temple Studios in New York. It was actually Haley's first session for Decca, but the song itself had uh, been released earlier in 1954 by Sunny Day and the Nights, but that particular version sank without trace. Bill Haley released his own um, version on the 10th of May, and at that time, it was actually the B-side, and 13 women, and only one man in town, uh, was on the uh, the A-side. But it didn't really matter, because uh, that didn't trouble the charts either. But one of the, well, the biggest name to come out of the 1950s, Elvis Presley. He had his first ever Sun recording session on the 5th of July, 1954. And that came about after he'd spent his um, second visit to the Memphis Recording Service in the January. Now, Memphis Recording Service is run by Sam Phillips, and that's what became Sun Studios and Sun Records. And Sam Phillips told Elvis um, he'd give him a call if ever he found a song that he felt would suit Elvis. Now, on a trip to Nashville, Sam Phillips came across a song called Without You, and he gave Elvis a call to come into the studio, thinking, oh, this could sound uh, good, but it didn't really. The uh, recordings didn't go too well, but rather than give up on Elvis, he introduced him to guitarist Scotty Moore and upright bass player Bill Black. And Phillips suggested that they, they try out some songs that they knew, and they tried out a few numbers. And then with Sam Phillips at the controls, they recorded That's All Right. It was released on the 19th of July, and it was Elvis's first single. It was coupled with Blue Moon of Kentucky. And if you look at the record label, um, it's credited to Elvis Presley, and then underneath, Scotty and Bill. Now, both were 1940 covers. That's All Right was written and released by Arthur Big Boy Crudup in 1946, as we heard earlier. And the B-side was actually uh, Bill Monroe and his uh, Bluegrass Boys. They originally wrote and recorded that. Now, a few days later, Sam Phillips gave Memphis DJ Dewey Daddio Phillips, no relation, um, a copy of the record to play on his Red Hot and Blue radio show on Radio WHBQ. So he became the first DJ to ever play Elvis. 
Now, Elvis recorded four more singles at Sun before moving on and signed up with RCA in the end of um, 1955. But arguably the first rock and roll hit single came from Bill Haley with Shake, Rattle and Roll, his cover of a uh, Big Joe Turner original. It gave uh, Big Joe Turner an R&B number one. It gave Bill Haley a number seven on the Billboard Top 40. And that uh, was July 19. 54 and like a lot of the white covers of um, black r&b songs uh, the lyrics were much more sanitized in the um, bill haley uh, version uh, compared to turner's much raunchier lyrics for that particular song but the birth of rock and roll came from a most unlikely source it was a movie on the 25th of march 1955 the movie Blackboard Jungle was released. Now that was based on a novel by Evan Hunter and it was set in inner city New York school against a backdrop of uh, teenage delinquency. The movie opened with a, a written preamble and underneath the uh, preamble outlining the problems of juvenile delinquency, the credits were rolling to Bill Haley's Rock Around the Clock. Now, the reaction to the, the movie was absolutely immediate, and it kick-started rock and roll around the world. Now, rock and roll around, rock around the clock was originally released in May 1954 with 13 women as the A-side. Well, when it was re-released after Blackboard Jungle in March 1955, 13 women was on the B-side. And I thought for our second song, rather than playing the well-heard rock around the clock we might have a little listen to what was the original a side now the b side and this is bill haley and his comets with 13 women and only one man in town i'm derek shelmerdine and you're listening to the rock and roll unraveled show we're taking a look at the rise and fall of american rock and roll in the 1950s now a whole host of rock and roll legends arrived in the wake of the blackboard jungle fats domino had, had his first r b hit the fat man back in 1949 but in april 1955 he managed to crack the mainstream with his first croc crossover hit and Ain't it a shame? Uh, Co-written with uh, Dave Bartholomew again. It was his 14th R&B hit. And this gave him an R&B number one for 11 weeks. But importantly, it took him into the Billboard Top 40 where he scored um, a number 10. Now, Fats Domino, with an estimated sales of uh, 65 million records, he sold more records than any other 1950s rock and roller except Elvis Presley. And his run of Billboard Top 40 hit singles lasted into 1963. Chuck Berry also arrived in the summer of 1955. He'd started his recording career with Joe Alexander and the Cubans in mid-1954. But he was introduced to uh, the Chess Brothers by blues legend and chum of his, uh, Muddy Waters. Now at his first chess recording session he recorded uh, Maybelline and that was based on Bob Will's 1938 recording of Ida Red. Now early copies of the single you'll see the writing credit go to Chuck Berry and DJ's uh, Russ Frato and Alan Freed and it wasn't uncommon in those days for DJ's to uh, manage to get their name onto the writing credit. This was his first uh, hit it um, gave him a number one R&B hit. He was there for 11 weeks at number one, uh, but it took him into the Billboard Top 40 as well at number five. Now, in 1972, uh, John Lennon and Chuck Berry played together on the Mike Douglas uh, TV show. And that was when John Lennon famously said, if you tried to give rock and roll another name, you might call it Chuck Berry. Little Richard, wow, his career is just uh, coming into the uh, frame as well. He'd been around a while, as most of them had. Um, he started out at the beginning of the 1950s um, with RCA after winning a talent contest where the record deal with RCA was the, the prize. He had a handful of signal, uh, singles there, but um, to no avail. 
In October 55, he released Tutti Fruity, and that was his first single on Speciality. Produced by Bumps Blackwell, it featured Huey Piano Smith on the record as well. And that gave him his first hit, gave him a number 17. Now, the song came about because during a break in his first recording session, Little Richard had started to sing one of the songs that he liked to perform in the in the clubs. And that had a very catchy refrain in Wop, Bop, Loo, Bop, Lop, Bam, Boo. Bumps Blackwell could see that the, ooh, this song has some potential, he thought, but the right ball lyrics were just a little bit too much for the sensitivities of the pop market. So he brought in Dorothy the uh to clean the, the lyrics up, and the result was Tutti Frutti. And she got a joint uh, writing credit, so the single itself is credited to the Bostri and Little Richard. Now, if you come across um, a song called Tutti Frutti by Slim and Slam from uh, quite early on, it's a different song. Now, as we came into 1956, oh, so many more heroes are coming into the frame. 27th of January 1956, Elvis released his first single for RCA, Heartbreak Hotel. The game his first hit. It was a number one for eight weeks. Now, on the song itself, he's accompanied by his old son buddies, guitarist Scotty Moore, and upright bass player Bill Black but he now had a new regular drummer with uh, DJ Fontana and he also used a couple of Nashville session musicians uh, guitarist Chet Atkins and pianist Floyd Kramer and they played with Elvis throughout his career they appear on an awful lot of Elvis's records now the song itself was written by Tommy Durden and Mayborn and Axton and the inspiration came from a newspaper article headed do you know this man and what the paper wanted to do was to identify a man who killed himself. And he'd left a note simply saying, I walk a lonely street. Now, Gene Vincent, when he arrived in May 1956, um, unlike most of his contemporaries, he actually came straight into stardom. Gene Vincent and his Blue Caps released Bebop Alula. It gave him a number seven. And it was co-written uh, by Gene and his manager, Sheriff uh, Tex Davis. Now, Elvis's fame is really starting to spread and the, the national fame really moved up a notch with his first appearance on The Ed Sullivan Show on the 9th of September, 1956, when he had an audience of 60 million viewers. Now, that represents an audience share of 82%. He performed uh, Don't Be Cruel, Love Me Tender, Ready Teddy and Hound Dog. It wasn't actually Elvis's first television appearance. On the 28th of January, he uh, could be seen on the Dorsey Brothers stage show. Now, we're only in October 1956, but sadly the writing's on the wall for really the beginning of the end for rock and roll's first hero, Bill Haley. I mean, in October 56, he released Rudy's Rock, and that was the last of uh, Bill Haley's string of Billboard Top 40 hits. We managed to get to 1934. He'd actually had his first hit in 1954 with uh, Shake, Rattle and Roll, and Rudy's Rock was his 14th Billboard uh, Top 40 hit. He did have one more hit in uh, 1958, and that was with Skinny Minnie. And at the end of the year as well, Hollywood decided they'd get in on the on the act. And in December, the movie The Girl Can't Help It had a release. And that was a light-hearted gangster romp starring Jane Mansfield. But it had a rock and roll uh, backdrop to the, to the movie. And a host of rock and roll stars appeared. And that included Fats Domino, Lynn Richard, Eddie Cochran, Gene Vincent. Now, Eddie Cochran performed 20 Flight Rock. And this is what Paul McCartney chose when he played his audition for John Lennon and the Quarrymen. And John was very impressed by the fact that Paul knew all of the words and chord changes for the song. And that's where the Beatles started, basically. And another famous situation in the December was the uh, Million Dollar Quartet, probably the most famous jam of them all. And that was at Sun Studios in Memphis. And the Million Dollar Quartet was Elvis, Jerry Lee Lewis, Carl Perkins and Johnny Cash. Now, how it came about was Carl Perkins was in the Sun Studios to record his next single, Matchbox. And Jerry Lee had recently signed to the label and had been roped in to play uh, piano 
Elvis and Johnny Cash happened to be passing by. I mean, Elvis was now with RCA and they dropped in to say hi. Now, Sam Phillips rolled the tapes and several decades later, the uh, recordings were actually made available on an official release. But the jury's still out as to whether or not Johnny Cash was involved in the actual recording or whether or not he left after the famous uh, photograph of them all around the the piano and there's so many interesting things going on at this time so we're still in december uh, elvis had his final performance at the louisiana hayride on the 15th of december 56 and mc horace logan uttered those immortal words for the first time elvis has left the building and that was done in an attempt to settle the rowdy crowd, uh, to encourage them to listen to the remaining acts on the on the show. The Louisiana Hayride was a, a country music show that was syndicated on radio stations across much of the South and West. And he provided Elvis with much of his sort of very early exposure to a, a wider audience. And staying with Elvis, sorry, 1956, from zero to hero. I mean, his first single was on the 10th of January, Heartbreak Hotel. And on the 29th of December 1956, Elvis had 10 singles on the Billboard Top 100. He was actually kept off the number one by Guy Mitchell, who for the fourth week at number one had his song Singing the Blues. But Elvis was there in a bunch of places. Number two with Love Me Tender from the soundtrack of his Love Me Tender movie really shortly before. Then seven with Love Me, 26, Don't Be Cruel, 38, when my blue moon turns to gold again. And at 47, he had his recording of um, Old Shep. Now that was written and recorded by Red Foley in 1935. And it was the first song that Elvis ever performed in public when he did a talent show in Tupelo on the 3rd of October, 1945. At 54, he had Hound Dog, Lieber and Stoller song that started life uh, for uh, Big Mama Thornton gave her an R&B number one in 1953 and Poor Boy another sound uh, soundtrack song taken from the Love Me Tender movie 70 with Anywhere You Want Me 78 Paralyzed and at 93 the Rogers and Hart song performed by Shirley Ross as the bad in every man in the 1934 movie Manhattan Melodrama now I might have been that his career was on a little bit, bit of a downturn uh, but on the 31st of january 1957 decker announced that bill haley's rock around the clock was the first uk single to sell one million copies it had loads of chart entries 55 56 and in the 60s and it sold an estimated 25 million copies around the world and there were still more legends to come in 1957 in february eddie cochran got his first uh, billboard hit uh, got to a number 18 with sitting on the balcony now that's got a writing credit to johnny d and johnny d is john d loudermilk now he wrote and originally recorded it and following hot on eddie cochran's heels was jerry lee lewis in march of 57 he released a whole lot of shaking going on and that gave him his first, it gave him a number three. Now the original version, that's by Big May Bell in 1955. The Everly Brothers also came to the fore in the spring of um, 57. Now they started out on the family radio show, Everly Family Show, and Chet Atkins was a big fan of the show and he introduced them to Columbia and they had their first Columbia single out in 1956. Sadly, it sank without uh, trace. But on the 20th of April 1957, the Everly Brothers released Bye Bye Love as their first single on Cadence, and that was a biggie for them. And it was also the first of many of their hits to be penned by the wife and husband team of Felice and Baudelaire Bryant. It was great to see that Buddy Holly finally found success in the May of 1957, and that was when he released um, That'll Be The Day. I mean, he'd started out in Decker. His first recording session there was at the beginning of 1956, uh, but none of his Decker recordings troubled the charts in any way. And when he teamed up with the Crickets, it became a whole different story. I mean, the writers for That'll Be The Day were Jerry Alice, and the Buddy Holly, and again, Norman 
Petty gets um, a credit there. But the crickets at this particular stage, on this particular song, are Jerry Allison, uh, Nicky Sullivan and Larry Wellborn. And the title of the song is taken from a line in a John Wayne movie, The Searchers, where he repeatedly says, that'll be the day. It was his first hit single. It was actually number one for a week, but it was released as The Crickets on the Brunswick label. And the reason I mention that particularly is that for contractual reasons, Buddy Holly and The Crickets both had separate contracts. Buddy Holly had a solo contract and the singles were released in America either as Buddy Holly on the Coral label or The Crickets on the Brunswick label. It was a lot more straightforward in the UK. They were all released on the uh, Coddle label. Time for our third song now. And from March 1957, this is the killer himself, Jerry Lee Lewis with a whole lot of shaking going on. The first nail in the coffin of American rock and roll came as early as the 12th of October 1957 when Little Richard was on tour in Australia. It was there that he found God and renounced rock and roll. Billed as the big show rock and roll, it also featured Gene Vincent, Eddie Cochran and Australia's first rock and roll band, Johnny O'Keefe and the DJs. Now part way through the tour, he played in Sydney. And it was there that he was reputed to have said to the audience, if you want to live for the Lord, you can't take rock and roll too. God doesn't like it. Shortly after this, he threw his jewellery into the Hunter River, or it might have been the uh, Sydney Harbour. But his epiphany was due to possibly a Sputnik passing overhead and signifying the end of the world, or maybe even a traumatic plane journey with the engines on fire sources for all aspects of this story vary considerably but what is for certain was that this was the point at which little richard and rock and roll party company when he returned to america he did record one final rock and roll session for speciality but on the 27th of january 1958 he enrolled into the oakwood theological college in huntsville alabama and there he became a seventh day adventist minister and following his conversion, he only ever performed uh, gospel songs. Well, that was until his return to rock and roll in 1962. Now, also in October uh, 1957, it was the um, demise really for Gene Vincent. He had his last American uh, top 40 hit with Dance to the Bop, made uh, number 23. Now, Elvis had a change of scenery in 1958. On the 24th of March, the U.S. Army greeted 5331761 Elvis Presley when he was inducted at the Memphis Draft Board. But he did manage to get back into the studio, and while he was on leave on the 10th and 11th of June, he made his last recording for nearly two years. I mean, he recorded five songs, and he arrived at his German base in the October in uh, Freiburg and spent the next 18 months there. I mean, during this period, he met... 14-year-old Priscilla Bewley, who actually became his wife, and then it all came to an end when he flew out of Germany on the 2nd of March 1960 and famously touched down in Scotland on his way home. He was officially discharged on the 5th of March, and on the 20th he was back in the studio working on his new album, Elvis is Back. He recorded his first uh, post-army single, Stuck on You, and filming for his fifth movie, GI Blues, well that short started uh, very shortly after this as well. Now Elvis the 1950s king of rock and roll became Elvis the 1960s silver screen matinee idol only to reinvent himself again in the 1970s but I'm sure we'll come back and visit Elvis's story at some point. But Jerry Lee Lewis's rock and roll career came to a very very abrupt end. I mean, he arrived in London for his first UK tour on the 22nd of May 1958. And at this particular point, when he arrived, he was absolutely at the zenith. He was at the height of his uh, popularity. Just a week earlier, his hometown of Faraday had held the first Jerry Lee Lewis Day. But when he arrived in London, it transpired in some interviews that Myra Gale was identified as uh, Lewis's child bride. Uh, responding to a reporter's question about her age, 
uh, it turned out that Mara Gale was only 13 years old and the daughter of his bass playing cousin, J.W. Brown. Now, Jerry Lee at this point discovered that uh, this might all work very nicely in Louisiana, uh, but for British fans, it really wasn't, uh, wasn't cricket, as they say. He played three poorly received um, concerts before pulling out of his own headlining tour to return to America. But the tour continued. British skiffle legend Chas McDevitt uh, stood into the, stepped into the, the breach. He did going for some serious damage limitation though because what he found was his american audiences that also uh, were deserting him in absolute droves in may he recorded and released the return of jerry lee single uh, but that didn't placate anybody and on the 9th of june 1958 he took out a full page in billboard magazine uh, in in the way of an apology uh, written as an open letter, but none of this stemmed the the tide. His record sales plummeted, and his rock and roll career never recovered. However, I mean, he left Sun in 1963, and he moved over to Mercury subsidiary label Smash, and then he reinvented himself as a country artist. And he had 40 or more um, hits between country hits between 1964 and 19. 81 but things weren't going well for buddy holly either in sort of novemberish 1958 he ended his management deal with uh, norman petty but the crickets decided to stay on with um, with petty so buddy holly was now a solo artist and in need of uh, some money he embarked on the winter dance party tour on the 23rd of January 1959, it opened at uh, George Devine's Ballroom in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and Holly's backing band was Tommy Alsop on guitar, drummer Carl Bunch, and Waylon Jennings on bass. Now, he went on to have a, a seriously successful career. Now, when the Winter Dance Party tour arrived in uh, Clear Lake, Iowa, they played the, uh, the surf ballroom, the tour bus was regularly breaking down. I mean, what we're looking at here was a tour of the American Midwest in, uh, in, in deep winter. That's a very, I've been there, it's a very, very cold place. And um, you can tell from the fact that uh, Carl Bunch actually suffered uh, mild frostbite on the tour bus and he was hospitalized after the concert in uh, Duluth in Minnesota. Now, to get away from these very harsh conditions on the tour bus, Buddy Holly decided to charter a light aircraft and fly to Fargo, North Dakota, for the next concert at nearby uh, Moorhead. Now, Holly's backing musicians, Waylon Jennings and Tommy Alsop, they were originally slated to accompany him on the flight. But Waylon Jennings gave up his seat for the Big Bopper. And Richie Valance won the flip of a coin and took um, Alsop's seat well the plane took off shortly after midnight and 3rd of february 1959 it crashed a few miles out of um, clear lake killing the pilot roger peterson and his three uh, three passengers but it's an ill wind as they say and the tragedy launched the career of fargo's own bobby v um the search went out to find some local talent and 15 year old bobby v and his backing band the shadows um, stood into the breach and they performed at the Moorhead concert uh, that evening. Now Frankie Sardo and Dion, they continued with the tour and they were joined by new headliners Jimmy Clanton and teen idols Fabian and Frankie Avalon. Carl Bunch, the uh, drummer who'd been hospitalised, uh, he rejoined the tour a couple of days after the crash. But it's interesting to note that um, the crickets never had another uh, uh, Billboard Top 40 hit after Buddy Holly died. Now, the end really came as well for um, Alan Freed. The payola scandal was really starting to bite. And payola was all about DJs taking payment for pushing new recordings or new artists. Absolutely widespread in the 1950s. And as well as payments in money or gifts, sometimes more subtle payment came from adding a DJ's name to the writing credit for a song. But it was the 21st of November 1959 that really marked the end when he was sacked by ABC for refusing to sign an affidavit 
that simply said that he never promoted recordings in return for for payment. Now, Alan Freed was one of the highest profile DJs and an absolutely ideal target for the House of Representatives subcommittee when they decided to crack down on payola in late 1959. In May 60, Freed was arrested for receiving payments of over £30,000 and in December 62, he pleaded guilty, uh, received a fine of £300 plus some massive legal costs and a six-month suspended sentence. I mean, the whole experience broke Freed and his career was over. He died, sadly died in uh, uh, January of 1965 and that time he was penniless and facing tax evasion charges. But things were still going well for the Everly brothers and they decided to have a change of label. On the 8th of March 1960, they had their first recording session for their new label, Warner Brothers. And the deal they got was a guaranteed $100,000 a year for 10 years deal. And it's written to be the industry's first million dollar deal for uh, a band or artist. Their first single came out in the April. That was Kathy's Clown. And it was written by Don and Phil. And it was a massive hit for them. They spent five weeks at number one in the US and seven weeks at number one in the uh, the UK but the end was uh, beckoning really for uh, even the artists who'd still been making hit records up to this point their string of hits on the Billboard Top 40 finally came to an end I mean Eddie Cochran released Come On Everybody which was his third and last Billboard Top 40 on the 27th of um, October 1958 it made number 35 just for a single week and for Chuck Berry, his string of hit singles came to an end in May 1959 when he released Back in the USA. That was actually coupled with Memphis, Tennessee, a very, very popular song with um, British beat and um, R&B groups in the early 60s. Like most of Berry's stuff, both sides were written by Chuck Berry. It was 37 again just for one week. Times finally changed for the, the Everly Brothers and their run of hits came to an end in April 1962 with a single called That's Old Fashioned, brackets, That's the Way Love Should Be, made number nine. I mean, their string had started in 1957 there. They hit it every year until 1962. And That's Old Fashioned was actually their 25th Billboard Top 40 hit. And the last of the people that uh, we've been talking about, Fats Domino. He finally, his run of hits finally came to an end as well. Now, it's not surprising that he was the one with the most records sold after Elvis Presley. His run didn't finish until September 1963 with Red Cells in the Sunset. That got him to 35, and it was his 37th crossover hit. He had a couple more R&B hits after this in 64, so what replaced rock and roll in America? Well, in the late 50s, rock and roll had been um, changing its face somewhat and, and uh, more and more of the clean cut, clean image um, teen idols like Bobby V, uh, Frankie Avalon and uh, Ricky Nelson had been coming to the fore. Dance crazes were also a big thing in the 60s. And 1960s saw uh, Chubby Checker enter the Billboard charts with uh, The Twist. Phil Spector and his wall of sound arrived at the end of 1961 with the Crystal's first single, There's No Other Like My Baby. And surf music was um, very, very popular as well. The Beach Boys had their uh, first hit with Surfing Safari in September of 1962. Well, that's the story of the rise and fall of rock and roll. I hope you've enjoyed listening to it as much as I've enjoyed putting the show together. There's an awful lot of detail in the show. And if you want to peruse it at your leisure, check out the blog of the show on my website. And that's www.rockandrollunraveled.com. And you can also find me on social media. So please hook up, say hi. You'll find me on Twitter at RNR Unraveled and Facebook at Rock and Roll Unraveled. Now, if you see a theme of 
Rock and Roll Unraveled developing here, it's because I wrote the book Rock and Roll Unraveled. It tells the story of rock and roll from its roots to mid-1970s punk. But now we're going to play out with one of the greatest rock and roll songs ever released. And from 1955, this is Little Richard and Tootie Fruity. <laughs> 